taping this now on the, on the tape so that I can remember when I get back uh, it's Detective Allen again who are now talking with uh, Charles. I remember Bob. Three nights before it happened, I saw that Bob quoted down there. I saw that movie on TV. I think it was killed three nights later. And my father came home and I told him about it. He was so thankful to God. Maybe that someone had seen the movie and been, you know, touched by the movie and was doing it or something. Because that movie, I mean, you know, I saw the club, that movie, and it was the exact same thing. Four people getting killed in Kansas. Yeah, it was a cold. It was a cold movie I saw. Well, I know that that movie was on and it was dead a few days later. And I don't believe it. school that morning early I remember because I got an extra study hall before my regular class started I knew I went to school early that day otherwise I probably would have been caught in the house with the rest of the family and my walk home after taking all my class my tests scored a 100 out of 100 in my biology really good it was a hard test and uh, right when I got to the corner across from my house I could see my garage was open. About the same time, I saw a little pamphlet on the ground. And it was one of the middle of Jehovah Witnesses watchtower pamphlets, the small ones. I picked it up and it said, uh, you need God in your life to keep you under this and that. And I said, I don't need this. And I threw it down on the ground. Man, did I need that. And I didn't know it at the time. Do you know how many people I walked in the backyard first. And uh, I, don't recall I saw my dog, Lucky, reason. outside. He was never outside, never. He wagged his tail. And I petted him, went to the door, I opened up the door, and I saw my mom's purse was thrown down on the stove, stuff had fallen on the floor, I had cute trays were sitting on the stove, and I was never, my mom kept the kitchen in pretty good shape, you know, it was never like that, and I said, is, is anybody home? And at that point, my baby brother, he's not my baby brother, my younger brother, Danny, he yelled out, Charlie, come quick. Mom and Dad are playing a bad trick on us. During my years as a detective, we worked a lot of gruesome cases down there. We worked homicides that weren't very pretty. But I don't remember ever working anything like the O'Carroll case. That was probably one case that stuck in my mind longer than any of them. Uh, I've had some, not anymore, but used to, I had some bad moments over that case. It was probably one of the saddest cases I ever worked. I ran back there and I saw my dad and he was dead. His eyes were bugging out, his tongue was half bit off, hanging to the side. The belt was cinched real tight around his neck. I grabbed him and uh, I shook him and I said, what have you done? Because I just knew in my heart, call it intuition, call it his sense of awareness, I knew that whatever had happened had come because of something he was involved with. Um, I looked at my mother, she was in her robe on her bed. She didn't look like my mother anymore, she just looked like a pile of rags or just beaten down, and all I could think of was at that point was my mom had told me that the only thing she ever prayed for, for herself, was to die in her sleep. She just wanted to die a calm, peaceful death. And I thought right then, there is no God. I hate God. I hate the world. I hate everything. I hate life. And I just, I, I really lost my religion at that moment. First of all, if there is a God, how could he allow such a sweet woman to die such a violent death? She, she couldn't do enough for somebody. And uh, he let her die like that. At that point, 
the, the start, things started happening pretty quick. The police came, well, more police came, they took me away. And I, I, I go blank at that point until I go to the police station. I remember getting sent to the scene. Wasn't him and her both strangled? And when I got there, there was other officers there. And I went in the bedroom and seen the little boy. I'll never forget the look on his face with that bag around his face. For some reason, I went to the basement. Of course, this was in the daytime. I didn't have my flashlight with me. And while I'm walking around looking for a light switch, I brushed into something. I didn't bang into it or bump into it. I just brushed something, and I didn't realize what it was. And then a little bit later, I found the light switch, and I seen the little girl hanging here. And I realized then that I had bumped into her, broke around her neck, and then hanging from her, kind of a raptor or something. But it's a memory that will never leave me. I'll never forget it. As far as the semen, we were told by psychiatrists and doctors at that time that there was enough semen on that floor to equal five ejaculations. And they said it would take a very deranged person to be able to do that. And, and I was down there when we found that, and it was all over the floor. When we got to the police station, my mind was turning at a million miles an hour. I'm looking, trying to find out who to, who to stab, who to shoot, who to hate, you know? And I go to the back and I tell them, I tell the police, go to my brother and sister's school and stop Joey and Josie from going home. They cannot go home and find us like this. Bring them to me. i got to have them with me right now. And uh, the cop said, uh, she said, don't worry about it. We've got it covered. It's taken care of. And uh, I brought it up about five, six, ten times. And they wouldn't tell me. They brought the, the, the chaplain to me and talked to me about, you know, having strength and being there for my brothers. This was, and then finally one of them said, we got to tell you that Joey and Joseph were, Josie and Joey were in the house. And they blew me away. They just fucking killed me. And uh, I went blank. I, I just went blank. Hate. Just evilness. Just it overcome me, you know, and uh, it stayed with me for 20 years. See, I should have been there. I should have been home. If I hadn't gone to school early that day, I would have been there. Because I know I would have been there. And uh, I already had my plan. I, already, I would have gone out a window. I would have, gone, I would have jumped right through a plate glass window. I would have made it. If the guy had a gun, I would have made him shoot me. That would have made a gun go off. That would give the other people time to run. It would give Lucky a chance to attack. I would have done whatever it took. Of course, at this time, BTK wasn't known. You know, this was the first one. Once upon a time, I went on a murder spree. I murdered your family. Good afternoon. This morning, KTV was contacted by the person who police say they believe murdered four members of the Joseph Otero family in January of 1974. The communication came in the form of a two-page typewritten letter addressed to KAKE Channel 10. It was signed with the initial BTK. BTK began today's letter with a question. How many do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? One little paragraph, he said, would have been enough. But in an earlier letter written in 1974, signed by BTK, he takes credit for the murder of Joseph Otero and three members of his family. In that letter, BTK spoke of a monster in his brain that made him kill. He is compelled to kill by what he calls Factor X, the same thing that made Son of Sam, Jack the Ripper, and the Hillside Strangler, and a list of other mass murderers kill. But with us right now is Chief of Police Richard Lemonian. Do you know what the, the initials BTK stand for? Yes, it's our feeling that the initials that uh, were placed there stand for bind, torture, and kill. He provided a list of his victims, beginning with the number five, where he wrote, you guess the victim and the motive. We have an individual who apparently has the... Believe it or not, I trained him. I did. He used to ride with me when he was a rookie. Or help train him. 
uncontrollable desire to kill at times. Shirley Vianne, murdered by strangulation in March of 1977. Not a rational person during that frame of mind. Nancy Fox, strangled December 8th, 1977. He tries to fight off the demons in his head, but is unable to do so. BTK itself has killed seven people, Chief. What kind of leads do you have? Well, very honestly, we have no solid leads at all. There is no way that this guy watched my family and then walked all the way from wherever he walked from and approached my house and took on my father, my dog, and my mother at the same time with uh, with the handgun. First off, look at the knots. Those ropes that were on my family weren't going to be in time. Why is a chair in my brother's room? And they made my dad sit in that chair and watch them kill my little baby brother. They untied my father in the middle of the torture session. Why? Because they needed him to write something. What do you need from a person? A map or a signature? I mean, I don't have the answer. I have my theories and my ideas, you know. But I really feel that his son that talking now, he may be right. My father was killed for a purpose, for information. And my dad used to go out with the heads of security of Panama, uh, import-export dealers, big people, big people, high-level high society and power. And uh, that doesn't add up for tech stars in the Air Force. The police department at that time said, I don't remember who it was, but they sent a couple detectives to Panama because we felt like there might be a connection between his military and Panama. And I think mainly because we come up with this composite. There's a guy that stole their car, and he was a South American-looking person. I don't know, Mexican or whatever. Good evening. Today, Wichita police confirm BTK is back. A letter sent to the Wichita Eagle last week is believed to be from the serial click killer. Police asked for help, and the public continues to respond. We got a man out there that committed eight murders, and none of us has been good enough yet to catch him. If you have a tip about BTK, call the tip hotline at 263-0138. That line is open from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. Now, the line is not traceable, so callers can remain anonymous. I mean, why did he go silent for 25 years? Now, the next question is, why is he resurfaced? Why is he resurfaced? Why did he go silent for 25 years, and now why is he resurfaced? And that, to me, that demon in my brain Factor X is a second cop. They're mean, down to the core, and they want to be mean, and that's why they do it. Yeah, it's a choice. It's a choice. Hey, Charlie. Hi. Oh, hello. How's it going? Just fine. Oh. Come on in. I'm trying to figure out what my, my number is, so I can tell oh, you. Okay. I don't know how to work my name. Well, you have a cell phone, right? Just call your cell phone. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Call myself. That's what a theory. Mm -hmm. so this, how's it going? this is my parole officer, Yvonne Boldenado. Okay. ISP, which is Intensive Supervised Parole. I will be on that for three more months. It's all part of the, the, the hoop system I have to jump through. And I don't care. They're, they're saying I can't even have a woman over here. It's like, what do they want? Gay parolees? <laughs> you know, you're not getting one here, man. I'm going to bring you a few rules. That's going to be one of them.
I do have a little bit of breaking news just within the past few hours. Uh, we here at State Television now have a night communication apparently directly from BTK. What kind of people is BTK? I mean, we don't know. I would love to know who the man is, you know. I can't hear Pat They interviewed me soon before they caught him. Yep. Couldn't remember. I was thinking it was after. No, because no, much before. Yeah, I was scared to death that he was going to find out and come and get us. So was I. I thought that was a, a ploy at first when Mark Levitz called to get into our oh. neck. <laughs> well, I was worried he'd find out. <clears throat> what year did they interview me? 2001. No, because I was living, oh yeah, it was after 2000, I know that, because I was living there already. At our place? I was living next door, yeah. Yeah. Because I was scared. Because, you know, he has a habit of taking out his target and their family. And that's why, yeah, I was well, scared. I had cancer yet. And Garcia was living there because just six minutes into one of the clips, you can hear Garcia oh, walking. Yeah. yeah. So no, I don't. You yeah. Have I remember now. I took my gun to bed with us every night. Yeah, I was scared. I was scared. I was, for some reason, I was thinking that they interviewed me after they caught him. No. But after he resurfaced, is what I was thinking. Yeah. I don't even know. What do you think of that music you had in there? Eerie. Isn't I that murdered creepy? your family and creepy as shit. I thought, I thought it was fit. goes pretty good with the show actually. You know I'm just about an ugly son of a bitch, ain't I? Oh fuck. Yep. <laughs> no. But you meant business. Huh? No, but you meant business. I'm trying to think. I I wish we could see that damn calendar hanging up on the wall. Yeah. This is a breaking news alert. Understand. Did you tell her? I can't understand nothing. What they're saying. Did you tell Sue that he said hi, Sue, on her wall? Yeah, she responded. Did you, you see that? The producer said hi to you. Good boy. I, I wrote back to him. Oh, okay. I didn't see it. So we're going to have to figure this TV out then so that you can hear it in the speakers. I wish we could show that there's a lady here in the building that wants to see this. And we we just, we show just need a new TV, that's all. Uh, well, we just need a new TV. I'll try again to program it to the right channel. On the big TV? Yeah. Pick on your side. The FBI and the Wichita Police Department have executed search warrants on a house on Independence Street in Park City. The investigation surrounds a person of interest, possibly in the BTK case. We can release this information. He has a degree in administration of justice. My sources are telling me they are 90% certain that this person of interest is indeed BTK. They are simply now waiting for a DNA test. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is a very historic day. The bottom line, BTK is arrested. Shortly after noon, yesterday, agents arrested Dennis Rader. Dennis Rader, a compliance officer, and also handled animal control. We've been tracking it down. The dogs are somewhat territorial as well as vicious. In the 30 years that I knew him, I never heard Dennis refer to BTK once. If he came to our door, I would have said, come on in, Janet. I knew him so well. It was one of those things that just seemed like it had to be someone else. The sheep were killed. <laughs> Get out, okay? First off, on Friday, 
my caseworker tells me that she told the recovery house about my situation with BTK, that there's a killer on the loose, and that I've been talking to him, and they said, well, we don't want him living here, so I lost a place to go to. And I thought, well, this is kind of ironic, and because the guy killed my family, and I'm trying to catch him, I gotta stay in prison. And then uh, finally, somebody said, Gerald, pack your stuff.